hi all. Audible? Yeah, OK. So hi all. Uh, welcome to the last session of the event. And here I'm going to talk about Jetpack libraries. So how many of you are Android developers here? And how many of you think that Android development is very easy? Very few. And how, uh, so uh, everyone else uh, feels it is hard. But now you will see how Android development uh, how do, was hard and how it became easy with Jetpack. So if you ever met a person or Android developer uh, who has been doing Android development since uh, 2010, 12, or 14, you will always hear them like, uh, like uh, in, our, in their era, Android development was that. We did that to achieve this. We did that, uh, this to achieve that. And uh, you, you might be thinking, like, why is that person selling? By the way, I'm also not from that era. I started Android development since 2016. So I'm also from Jetpack era. Uh, so let's see how these things evolved with Jetpack. So yeah, uh, I'm already introduced. So let's skip this slide. So let's see the history of why uh, Jetpack came into existence. And you know, Android has been there since more than a decade now. Like, now Android 14 is, has been released. And from Android 1 to Android 14, there are a lot of features. A lot of features came. A lot of features uh, went, got deprecated, and all. And while these uh, features, whenever a new version of Android is released, there were new APIs for Android developers. So what you do is like uh, when you uh, r try to implement those new features or uh, try to use these APIs, your code gets crash on the older versions or does not support for some OEMs and all. Like with new versions, there are some deprecations, right? Because uh, let's say if some in Android 14, if any function is deprecated, it will work only till Android 13 devices and it won't work for Android 14. So backward compatibility was the issue with uh, all coming Android versions. Then we have different OEMs. We have Samsung, Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo, different kind of devices. These, uh, so Android has given them some guidelines uh, while uh, developing the, their OEMs. But we, we see, if you are an Android developer, and uh, if you have a lot of user base for your application, you might be seeing some crashes only coming on a Samsung device, some crashes only coming on uh, Xiaomi devices. right? So this happened because of this only. Then we have different devices, different screen sizes, and uh, that all. So consistency, like making your app consistent across all of the devices was a challenge earlier. And then we have some custom ROMs, because uh, in Xiaomi we have that uh, MIUI, then Samsung has one UI. So these uh, custom ROMs also modify some of the original Android uh, features, right? Then we have some API restrictions, like some, for example, in Android 10, there are some APIs from uh, Telephony Manager, like you cannot Till Android 9, you were able to uh, retrieve device IMEI number. But after 10, uh, there was API restrictions. So uh, let's say you are writing a code. Then till Android 9, it will work fine. After Android 12, your code will start crashing. Like you will lose users. So there were some restrictions. And there were some hardware features. Every device has different camera, different uh, microphone, etc. So compatibility was the issue across all these features. And there are many mo more of the issues. Like if you are, if you are faced, you can uh, relate how these are issues. So if something is uh, working on your device, it doesn't mean it will work on everyone's device. Like uh, this is the debate you usually do with your QA, right? Correct. So uh, that's that's the case with Android, and that's a never-ending pain, I guess, for Android development. So before Jetpack, we used to write our code like this. Like if if, if device is on running on Android 10 and above, then do this. And e even if on uh, Android 10 and above, if the something feature is enabled, then do this. Else, like your, uh, you have a lot of, you need to write a lot of boilerplate code for your UI uh, for uh, writing features. So this was the situation of Android developer back then, before Jetpack, because uh, there were a lot of issues, as we discussed. So finally, after all this, uh, in 2018, Google released Jetpack libraries. Google announced Android X libraries in Google I.O. 2018. And they deprecated all support libraries for them. And later, it, it got renamed to Jetpack in 2020. So let's see how Jetpack library uh, came and what is Jetpack libraries. I guess if you are Android developer, you already know Jetpack libraries. But 
It is a suit of libraries for your all use cases, and it helps developer to follow the best practices. Uh, it also reduces your boilerplate code because whatever common code you need to write for your use case, it is already already written by the Jetpack developers at uh, Google, and uh, they make sure that uh, they make sure that uh, whatever code they have written works consistently across all devices and all Android versions. Uh, they always get feedback from developers like us. You might have seen Issues Tracker, right? Whenever something happens, you report to Issues Tracker, and they uh, fix it and release it in a different version. So that's uh, how convenient it is. Because if we write it, and we will never get what's going on wrong. It is built on top of Android SDK framework. And that's why it is not uh, bundled with Android OS. You need to. Uh, declare Jetpack libraries from your Gradle files, right? And they are constantly being updated and improved. Every Android version you can see, with every Android version, there are new Jetpack libraries. So let's explore some popular Jetpack libraries and how can you leverage them inside your application. So very basic library is Jetpack Core. So whenever you now create Android project from scratch, this library is automatically in, uh, included with your project. So Jetpack Core is uh, Extension library for your activity classes or uh, your normal Android use cases, uh, such as, for example, you have activity. Then activity has been evolving since Android 1 API. If some new features are uh, coming in activity, activity class of uh, Android, then Jetpack Core makes sure that the, they have all these uh, common methods which can work across all Android uh, devices. Then they have common text utils. For example, you might be using text utils dot is blank, uh, is empty, et cetera. Then you have common animations utilities. Like every application has some common application uh, utilities. For example, you need to uh, support bounce animation, uh, interpolator animation, et cetera. And these APIs are backward compatible. Like uh, in Android 8, there were some uh, new notification features uh, or restrictions uh, introduced. So the, it was provided by this code, Jetpack Core library. So in such a way that whatever you are uh, writing code with Jetpack Core, it will be forward compatible and backward compatible as well. Then we have Jetpack Activity. So Jetpack Activity is all about uh, you, are, you, uh, you create activities uh, for, for your screens, right? So that compatible APIs for older versions and newer versions are uh, bundled with this uh, library. For example, on back press dispatcher. In Android 13, you have this predictive back gesture. So that you can also uh, do with this. And now, uh, in, act in Android, so when you request for permissions, or uh, when you uh, want to open a file from uh, external uh, activity, then you, you do what? You, uh, you launch intent, and then you get back result in, uh, on, uh, on activity result, correct? So that is, no, uh, that is now deprecated you have to use activity result launcher. And that's the part of Jetpack activity library. It's not bundled with operating system. So photo picker, yeah. And if you are uh, using Jetpack Compose, then that's also part of Jetpack activity module now. So if you want to uh, use Jetpack Compose inside activity, then this is uh, good to go. Then uh, fragment. Fragment is uh, like what I can say about fragment. Fragment is uh, such a component in Android which is always hated by everyone, right? Who, who likes Fragment here? Nobody likes Fragment. Acha, thank God. <laughs> so all uh, Kotlin extensions uh, related to Fragment are inside this Jetpack Fragment. Uh, like you, ca you want to get data from Fragment, or you want to further uh, navigation. So that Fragment utilities are uh, basic common Fragment utilities are included in this Fragment. And uh, if you want to test your Fragment from your UI test, or uh, like uh, this thing. Uh, Espresso tests, et cetera. Then app compat. So app compat is a thing which do what? So earlier there were issues like, for example, uh, you have uh, declared some components in uh, your application. It used to uh, dis uh, display correctly on some devices, and it used to fail on some other devices because of this uh, uh, operating system level stuff. So app, com app, compat, uh, app compat has uh, these APIs, which has uh, Compatibility issue solved for every device and every OS. For example, if you are showing a toolbar, toolbar, uh, I think modern toolbar for Android was released for Android Lollipop. But if you use App Compat library, it can support that modern toolbar on even a KitKat device. So that was the power of uh, App Compat library. 
then SDK compatible view classes. For example, you can directly use app compat button, app compat text, which will support whatever new. Uh, so, for example, in Android 15, there is a new feature in our text text class, text view class. So that feature will be only available on devices above Android 15. But if you want to support the same for Android uh, 14 and below, the, then app compat text will help you to achieve same the result, achieve the same results. And uh, we have the same layouts for linear layout, compote, relative layout, etc. Then uh, let's say if you want to modify or replace the theme of the wrap context. For example, you, you have a UI, and inside UI, just a specific part of the UI, you want, you want to adopt another theme. You can use this context theme wrapper for that use case. So these are some common utilities. There, are, there is much more you can explore by uh, visiting the documentation. Then we have Jetpack Lifecycle. So Jetpack lifecycle uh, came for and solved most of the major issue, I guess, for Android. Otherwise, lifecycle management were, was very easy, uh, was very hard earlier. You might have seen a lot of memory leaks in your application, correct? If you use leak canary and all, uh, leak uh, memory leak uh, happens because uh, we uh, don't handle lifecycle. For example, your activity is launched, your activity fragment, whatever, uh, it is visible, and after some time, uh, it is closed. But you but you fail to uh, clear the resources created by this uh, screen, correct? So this problem was automatically solved by Jetpack Lifecycle. They came and solved uh, uh, life cycles for activity, fragment, view model. So you can basically do lifecycle aware programming with this. These components help you to uh, produce better organized and often lightweight code and easier to maintain. Now, it means you can uh, you cannot ask consumer. Consumer means developers. For example, you are creating your class. You, don't, you, you now don't need to manually clear the resources for that class. You can just take lifecycle owner from the, from the activity or the like API, API interface, and you can take responsibility of creating stuff, let's say on destroy, on, um, on stop, et cetera. Then there, uh, there are some coroutine, coroutine APIs, uh, like lifecycle scope, view model scope. For example, this. Let's say you are inside activity and uh, you, you run this code lifecycle scope.launch and inside launch you can write your suspended functions. So this will make sure that whenever activity is closed, all, core, uh, all threads in launched inside, uh, all, all, all operations happening inside launch will be automatically get cancelled uh, when activity is uh, destroyed. So you don't have to worry about cancelling them manually. Everything is automatically handled by this. Then Jetpack navigation. So. Uh, some time back I said everybody hates Fragment. It is because of that only, because Jetpack navigation was not there earlier. Uh, because before Jetpack navigation, if you have to, okay, single activity, uh, uh, single activity architecture is generally uh, recommended by uh, Google or like everyone says, right? But this was, it was very hard to uh, maintain on our own without Jetpack navigation, because you need to write a lot of boilerplate code for transitioning from one screen to another screen, then uh, you got a fail, for example, uh, when your application is launched, if user is not logged in, you will show them login page, correct? And after performing login, you will show them home page. And if user is already logged in, you will uh, you will show them only home page. But if user logs in, then you have to make sure that login and when uh, user uh, lands on home page, and if user press back, he should not again uh, land on the login page, right? So that kind of handling made uh, become very easy with Jetpack navigation. It allows user to navigate across into and back and forth uh, from different screens of the application. And it, it becomes very easy to handle of fragment transactions. It has support for animations, whether you want to uh, show slide animation, show uh, fade animation, any kind of animation among the transition of screens. And you can handle deep links. Deep links mean what? For example, sometime you receive links on WhatsApp. And after clicking on that link, automatically your uh, mobile application is launched, correct? So that kind of handling also become very easy with Jetpack navigation. Then there are safe arguments. So say, uh, for example, you want to transfer argument from this fragment to another fragment while launching that fragment. So this safe arg supports that. So there is a simple UI, for example, when you click on some uh, item here, then it will be open. If you click that plus button, the new activity uh, will be launched. So this kind of um, uh, visualization you can create with Jetpack navigation. So it's simply like drag and drop thing. And when you click back, it will be again uh, uh, again uh, navigate back on uh, the same page. So that's all. Then recycler view. 
before recycler view there was a list view how many of you have used list view and how many of you you have used list view but uh, you never got out of memory error and all acha okay so that's why recycler view is there it is meant for displaying list of items so with list view uh, so with recycler view you can create a application which uh, on which you can show list of items for example you can build your own social media applications on uh, um, like twitter then you have a listing of food items like zomato swiggy etc but what is advantage of uh, recycler view is it is memory efficient it only uh, renders your items which are only visible on uh, your ui once you scroll your all uh, items are recycled that's why its name is recycler recycler view and it is mainly optimized for performance and which is highly customizable you can create any kind of ui with recycler view and it is very matured api in android now then you have view pager with view pager you can uh, create your apps just like you, you can see instagram reels or uh, youtube shorts like it it feels like a page right you can uh, swipe and either your uh, like content will be switched or it will stay on same page so that kind of ui you can create with view pager and it makes your fragments swipeable it is very easy to use like you require very little and less code to achieve this because jetpack has written us for it and it is very flexible we can display variety and different types of pages and it is optimized for performance and you can totally control its uh, look and feel which is highly customizable how many of you uh, use uh, tinder or bumble so that kind of your uh, swipeable ui can you, you can also uh, uh, build with view pager then we have constraint layout so with constraint layout you can uh, build responsive layouts responsive as in we some uh, sometime back heard responsive means like we can have very adaptable ui on across all uh, kind of uh, surfaces and the main advantage of constraint layout is it brings a flat hierarchy because what used to happen earlier uh, there were li relative layout and uh, linear layout like lot of hierarchy and hierarchy causes issues in performance of loading of that screen so constraint layout came here and constraint layout allows you to de design a ui in such a way that you are uh, you know joining your puzzle just just uh, add your ui components just add constraints for them and everything will be taken care by constraints and constraint layout which results in better performance better uh, loading of your ui screen it is very flexible and easy to build with android studio editor then uh, we have jetpack compose i guess i can skip this because uh, like adit already talked about jetpack compose and how it is used so the main advantage of jetpack compose is it it is interoperable with android views so if you want to use jetpack compose you don't need to migrate your whole app into jetpack compose you can still use some part of jetpack compose inside your existing application for example we at paytm also using jetpack compose for some of the screens and some of the ui components uh so yeah i i don't need to show show code because adit already demonstrated a lot of it then we have uh, emoji 2 so emoji 2 is a li jetpack library that su uh, supports compatibility of emojis across devices okay just like this laptop is not supporting emojis if you try to integrate emojis in a, a device which doesn't support emoji so such characters are getting uh, displayed on the devices so in order to support that emoji 2 is there which has backward compatibility for lower android versions so if you are building a chat application or any kind of application that in which you want to uh, add support for emojis emoji 2 is your uh, way to go library then media 3 i guess in the first session um, mayuri or uh, satish already uh, demonstrated media 3 session but media 3 is a library that enables uh, display rich audio and visual experiences so you can build your own kind of a streaming or uh, media application and uh, it has very simplified architecture you need very little code you don't need expertise uh, on the exo player you just need to use uh, uh, this methods provided by this media 3 library and you are good then it includes exo player as a default implementation inside it so you don't need to uh, worry about it and uh, it has a feature in which you can allow background or picture in picture playback for example you are watching cricket on a streaming application like jio cinema hotstar etc anything uh, when you close the application you automatically get into picture into picture in picture mode right so that kind of uh, api you can easily build with media 3 then it includes transformer let's say you are building a video editing application you can easily build it with uh, transform up of uh, media 3 then we have palette 
So palette is uh, kind of a very small and useful utility which extracts prominent colors from the images. For example, now if you click the picture of this hall, then what are the uh, prominent colors here? I think brown is the prominent color here, right? So it can, it has ability to uh, generate colors from images. For example, there is a simple function palette dot from bitmap and it can generate a palette. How many of you uh, use the songs application like uh, Geo Savan or Spotify? Then you might have seen, let's say whatever song we uh, play, the, every song has some cover image, right? And cover image has some colors. So song application automatically adopts to that image. Uh, image colors. For example, this uh, this is some song, uh, and it has a uh, very dynamic image. That image has blue, purple, pink, etc. colors, and you can see that uh, whole UI has adopted that color for their UI, and uh, theme has literally changed. So this kind of dynamic theming, uh, Spotify or Geo Savan adopts using Palette. So if you want to create application which also need to support this, then you can use this Palette, and we. Uh, it has very simple API for that. For example, when we uh, call this method, and it, it will give me a list of these four colors from that image. Then we have Jetpack window. Uh, so I guess uh, in the morning session, we already discussed, like with Jetpack window, we can uh, support different form factors for your Android development, multi-window environment. Uh, it is only uh, supported from Android 14 and above. And its initial targets are foldable devices. And future releases will extend to more display types and window features, for example, tablets and et cetera. And uh, here, here was a use case, uh, I mean, a case study of uh, Google Chrome at, as its multitasking got increased by 18x for larger screens with using Jetpack windows. Then we have Jetpack Splash. So in Android 12, you may have seen your application uh, Splash got a different look. Have you seen this? Correct. So, but that splash was only released for Android 12 and above. So what happens for Android 12 and below, right? So Jetpack Splash is there, which has forward compatibility and backward compatibility port. So if you include that, your uh, application will show the same splash screen as it shows for Android 12 and above, even on older versions. So just like this Gmail has the splash screens. Like, so it has compatible with lower Android versions, and it maintains the app's unique branding with customization. So if you want to support that kind of uh, new Splash, which was introduced some, uh, I guess, one year ago, you can use Jetpack Splash for uh, uniform Splash screens across your all devices. Then Jetpack App Startup. So you might face, uh, some of you might be facing like uh, your application is taking too much time to launch, taking too much time to load. When you, when you click App Icon, it is uh, showing white screen for the long time or Splash screen for, for the long time, and uh, it is opening very late. Actually, App Startup, uh, Improving uh, or maintaining good app startup is very challenging and uh, recommended as well for retaining users. So app startup uh, Jetpack library is here, which can provide a straightforward way to, perf uh, to performant way to initialize components in application startup. So normally what happens, uh, whenever you uh, declare your starting items for Android, you use content providers. And multiple content providers are, if, if, if there are multiple content providers in application, then uh, you know the theory that before application instance, content providers are initialized always. So all content providers can take some time. So Jetpack App Startup do what? They just create a common content provider and include all initializers, like whatever we are initializing with App Startup, it can be initialized in a single uh, content provider. So thus your initialization becomes very fast. And App Startup allows you to define component initializer that share single content provider. This can significantly improve your app startup time. That's all. Then we have paging three. So now, if you if you have a need of application in which you want to show endless scrolling, just like a social media application or YouTube application, so paging three is very simple application which has support for uh, uh, showing or uh, showing or loading your data in pages. It has support for local storage or network data source. For example, in WhatsApp, you have uh, you can use WhatsApp even if your internet is uh, off or we can say offline first architecture. It can show your data from uh, offline cache. So that, ca that is also supported. And if you want to paginate your items from network data, or a REST API or anything, so that's also supported with paging three. You can configure it with a recycler view or Jetpack Compose with uh, very easy. And um, you literally require very less code to implement such kind of uh, UI with paging three. And it has built-in support for error handling 
and refresh or retry capabilities. For example, your page loading fails, and you, you have implemented a swipe to refresh layout. That kind of uh, implementation you can easily do with paging three. Then we have RoomDB. So how many of you have used SQLite database before RoomDB? So you know, you know the pain, right? You need to declare a lot of cursors, then query a cursor, then um, get data from that cursor, then typecast it. After typecasting it, if you fail to close the cursor, boom, right? Like you, uh, you lose a lot of resources and all. So RoomDB has solved this for us. So uh, with this, you can imagine like we need to use a lot of, uh, we need to write a lot of boilerplate code for our uh, uh, database. And if we change any field in some specific version, your app gets crashed. So RoomDB has a handling for it. It is a, it compile time verifies SQLite queries. We can save our data in a SQLite storage. And it has support for annotations for uh, all uh, the operations, which can minimize uh, our boilerplate code. Like you don't need to worry about boilerplate code. Like whatever boilerplate we were writing earlier with SQLite library, it is same after RoomDB, but RoomDB, RoomDB will write it for you. You don't need to write it. And it is streamlined for database migration. It has support for uh, good, uh, it has support for integration test as well. So for example, if you add integration test for RoomDB migrations, and include it in your CI system, you will automatically get to know whenever, if something goes wrong. So this is how simple, simple it is now. You just uh, declare a DAO interface. You can say you want to insert, you want to query something, and REST implementation will be implemented by Jetpack RoomDB and Jetpack Data Store. So how many of you have used uh, shared preferences? Right, everyone uses shared preferences. So shared preferences had some issues, like your application face a lot of ANRs and all, right? Because of shared preference, if developers do mistakes, obviously we are humans and we have right to do mistakes. So uh, in, uh, in shared preference, there are methods like commit and apply. If we use commit, then um, it blocks our main thread for saving the database. So this kind of mistakes were there. And in shared preference, there was a no safety of threads. Like it used to perform all operations on the main thread, like reading operation, writing operation, etc. So that was the main cause of ANRs and Jetpack Data Store came, which has support for storing key value pairs and typed objects or preferences. And uh, it can also save your data in the form of poor protocol buffers. So what we used to do with shared preference, let's say we want to uh, save some data in form of uh, some object. Then what we used to do, we used to convert it into a JSON and then save. And while getting it, the value of it, we used to uh, get value as a JSON string and converting from JSON to object. So that was uh, also not performant way. So protocol buffers are supported here, where in which you can directly store your objects inside Jetpack Data Store. And this library is fully built with Kotlin coroutines, which is full power packed. And executes all your operations on the background thread, so your main thread is always safe. You can always retrieve values from the background thread, even if you call them from main thread. And if you want to use the Jetpack Data Store, easy migration is also available from shared preferences. So a lot of companies have already migrated to Jetpack Data Store. Then it is very a reliable data, store, uh, data storage. Like Even if it gets corrupted somehow, it has ability to recover itself. Then we have Jetpack security. Uh, you know, in college or what, we, we learn a lot of cryptography or uh, like encryption, decryption, uh, algorithms and all. But there is no, like there is a scope of mistakes for us. Like we can uh, do mistakes or keep some vulnerabilities in our logic of encryption or decryption. So Jetpack security is here, which has all these APIs for security based practices with great encryption and good uh, performance. For example, there is a, uh, API called encryption file. Just like you create a file in uh, normal Android or Java, like you just uh, create an instance of file with some uh, string file instance. You can use encrypted file, which does what? When you call save, save file method, it automatically uh, encrypts the data of file in uh, with uh, some algorithm of uh, encryption algorithm like SHA-256, etc. And when you read file, it automatically decrypts it. So you don't have to worry about encryption. Everything will be taken care of this API. Then we have encrypted shared preference. For example, you, we always uh, store our authentication tokens and all in our application, correct? 
So for storing such sensitive data, you can use encrypted shared preference, which really makes hard to uh, recover if some hacker is trying to uh, like dig into your application. Then we have work manager. So before work manager, they like handling background task was a very tedious job. Like it was not reliable earlier, correct? Like we we might have feel faced a lot of uh, pain here. So it is a recommended solution for persistent work and uh, background processing. Work is persistent when it's uh, scheduled through app restarts. And for example, uh, when your application is uh, closed, or even if your device is rebooted, the work manager remembers what work we has given it to execute. It has support for work constraint. For example, uh, for executing ABC kind of work, I need internet connection, I need good storage, I need uh, battery to be on a good power percentage, et cetera. So it is very robust, and it has the uh, ability to recover tasks, et cetera. So for example, uh, you, may, you may have seen whenever you upload a tweet or uh, upload an image on tweet, Twitter, whenever you post. So whenever, even if you close your application, Twitter works in background. And same goes for Instagram or uh, like when you upload stories, et cetera. So this kind of stuff you can do with uh, Work Manager. And we have Expedit Work support as well, uh, which has support for immediately executing your task. And uh, Work Manager API has retriability and cancelability. And work chaining. For example, you want to execute number of works in the chain. For example, when A work is completed, then only you want to execute B work. So that kind of chaining is also possible. So if you want to schedule one-time worker, for example, you just want to fire and forget work, you can, you, you can use one-time worker. If you want to some work happen periodically, for example, every uh, one hour you want to capture user location or uh, any kind of capture, uh, capturing data that you can do with periodic work manager. So you just have to declare that you want to use periodic work manager, and it will be automatically executed by uh, Work Manager API. You don't have to manually uh, take care of it. Then we have Camera X. So Camera was a very painful task before Camera X. Like, you know, whenever you build camera applications, like uh, any kind of application, it used to work on some devices, it used to fail on some devices. So that was very tedious task. And Camera X came, and it became very easy to do camera development. It is very consistent and easy to use API that works across uh, majority of Android devices. It is backward compatible with Android versions. And it, has, it is basically designed in a use case uh, driven. So for example, the, uh, these are some use cases. Uh, if you want to display preview of your application uh, camera, you can preview. If you want to do image analysis on your UI, for example, you want to analyze your image. Uh, let's say you are building an AI application on which you want to uh, do real-time object detection, face detection, et cetera. Or for example, you are using this uh, UPI applications, right? Uh, like phone pay, pay, TMG pay, et cetera. So you always uh, scan your barcodes, uh, QR codes. So that kind of application you can easily build with uh, Camera X. Then you can build your own uh, Snapchat-like application with image capture, and you can build your own um, video capturing uh, content. Then uh, we have support for biometric. Jetpack biometric is there to solve your, uh, so in applications like uh, Paytm money or Grow or any kind of UPI application, you, you always see that uh, you required biometric, uh, like th fingerprint to proceed into application, right? So that kind of content you can uh, easily build inside your application with biometric with just few lines of code. It has support for face recognition, fingerprint recognition, and it can support uh, pin, pattern, et cetera, whatever you have set inside your device. Then uh, you have credentials. So credentials, I guess we already saw in the first session, so fast forwarding it. It has uh, support for this, like we saw, it, it has support for passwordless authentication, basically, which uh, Mayuri, I guess, already uh, explained to us. Then we have Jetpack App Search. So App Search is actually alpha library, which is recently released by Jetpack. Which ha it has high performance on-device search capabilities. So what happens whenever you are using SQLite database or et cetera, you need a lot of querying, and it does not support full text search, correct? Let's say if something uh, not matches with SQLite query, then it simply uh, won't give you a response. So with Jetpack App Search, you can easily build that, which is very fast than SQLite. So you can build your custom in-app search app capabilities. It has lower latency than SQLite, as I already said. And it allows users to search for content even if your app is offline, because everything is cached. And it has efficient indexing, and uh, it can query over large data sets as well. So something like this. For example, your UI has some 
data. You just feed it to App Search, and App Search will store it in the form of documents. And wherever you need it, it will just query from the, those stored documents. Then uh, custom tabs is very simple API. For example, in your application, you need to show some web pages. Then obviously, WebView is there, but WebView does not support everything inbuilt. You need to implement it on your own for this. So with custom tabs, you can uh, create your own such kind of UI. Let's say on click, you can uh, launch this Chrome tabs. It has a custom, you can customize toolbar, custom actions, and height, height of the like, browser, basically. Then we have Jetpack Health. So if you are building a health healthcare application, which you know tracks the fitness of a person, like on-device data, basically, within an ecosystem. For example, you want to capture activity like running, swimming. You want to capture their uh, body measurement, cycle tracking, nutrition, uh, sleep, sleep data. So this kind of data you can easily uh, maintain and uh, organize with Jetpack Health. And for example, blood glucose, body temperature, and oxygen, et cetera. There are many more libraries like this. Like, it is not possible to demonstrate all of them in a single session. So like there are, there is a hilt for dependency injection, async layout inflator. Then uh, benchmarking utilities like uh, micro benchmark, macro benchmark for measuring the performance of your application. Then there are testing utilities like Espresso, Compose UI test, UI automator for automation testing. Then we have car APIs, TV APIs, WebKit APIs, and there are much more you can uh, visit on this site and see all the available Jetpack libraries. So after all this, since Jetpack is doing everything for you, you are not doing anything, right? Jetpack is doing everything for you. Jetpack has written common code for you. So everyone can claim that they are expert like this. Because now everyone can do anything. Any Android developer can do any kind of use case with the help of Jetpack libraries. So that's all. And here are some uh, resources to learn Jetpack. Uh, I will share the slides so you can directly cl uh, click, click on the links. Then uh, if you want to connect me, uh, connect with me. If you have any doubts, you can easily uh, reach out to me. Like I have my website, and from the website, you will get my uh, uh, contact links. And whatever I uh, learn uh, every time, I share my learnings on my blog site. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you for being an amazing audience.